Okay, so, so for the pediatric part two, so we're going to talk about a number of evidence-based approaches to, to kids, right? And again, which kids do we need to test? Which kids don't we need to test? And we're going to talk about lumbar puncture some more. Um, risk stratification is a really important thing that we do for children with fever, okay? Because we want to know who's at risk for getting sick, who's not at risk for getting sick. We're going to talk about um, uh, the American College, the American College of Emergency Physicians, right, ASEP, and then the American College of American Academy of Pediatrics. So these two groups have some suggestions, and we'll talk about what they have to say about this. And um, and then we're going to talk about this first section here, which talks about some recent algorithms. Okay, and then um, again, most of the algorithms that we have are kids less than 60 days. Okay, because once you hit, you know, once you're over the three-month three mark, at that point, really, it, a lot of it we're going to see is more um, clinical gestalt, you know, what does uh, the clinician think, um, do these kids look sick, but when we start to get under that, and again, especially under um, 60 days, and then you're going to see, you know, under 28 days, this is a little bit more algorithmic, and we'll look at that. All right, so the first question here. Does fever evaluation vary with patient age? Yeah, of course it does, right? This is what we just talked about. So kids less than 28 days, right? These are the ones that we're most aggressive with. Um, when we get between 29 and 60 days, we're following our algorithms. And then when we're more than 60 days, you know, pretty much it's like based on our years of experience and whether the kid looks sick, and that's how we do it. So less than 28 days, these kids are getting mostly your full septic workup mostly with lumbar punctures. And we're going to talk again more about lumbar punctures, and we're going to see which kids don't need it. We're going to even get down to one week, okay? So we're going to even talk about kids older than one week, whether they need lumbar punctures or not. And then 29 to 60 days, again, this is more the protocol plus minus LP. Um, and then whether we admit them or not, it's based on what we find. Kids less than 28 days, all these kids are coming in. And then greater than 60 days, you know, it's basically our clinical impression. All right, so let's start to talk about some of these algorithms and, and some of this risk stratification stuff. So this first, next question says, what are the current algorithms and recommendations for the management of pediatric patients with fever? Okay, so this, you guys have this table, okay, and this is the traffic light criteria. So this is from the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence. Okay, nice, this is British. Um, and it's a system for identifying uh, risk of serious illness. And they break it down by looking at color, right, the color of the kid, activity, um, you know, respiratory status and circulation. And, you know, you'll see the different colors. They say, you can tell it's British because they have green, amber, and red, right? That's how you know. Um, so green, this is basically like your well-appearing child, okay? They have normal color, they don't have pallor, they're awake, you know, you can interact with the child, they'll coo to you, um, you know, they're either crying because, you know, you're irritating them some way, or they'll come in their parents' arms. Um, but these kids, what they're saying is these kids can be managed at home with appropriate advice, okay? Then you get into the red criteria, now, this red criteria, it's important to note that part of this is if you have a temperature greater than 38 and you're between 0 and 3 months, or if you have a temperature greater than 39 and you're between 3 and 6 months, that automatically puts you in the red criteria. And then it's all the things that intuitively you would think, right? These kids can look pale, they can look mottled, they look sick, they're unarousable. Anything in this red criteria and I would actually go so far as to say, as we go through this other criteria and these other algorithm, algorithms, this is common sense stuff, okay? Like, you're going to look at this and you're going to say, yeah, this kid is sick, right? I'm obviously going to work this kid up. So, so that'll reassure you a little bit, knowing that you're a good clinician, because this is the stuff you're already doing, right? If you see a kid that's like super tachypnic and grunting and pale and mottled, you're not going to be like, yeah, go home, take some Tylenol, right? No, you're going to be like, you need to be evaluated. And so this is exactly what this is telling us. Anywhere that falls in the red criteria, they're saying this patient needs face-to-face -face assessment, okay? All right, so the first abstract here, 
takes a look at this traffic light criteria to see how well it worked. And it's a retrospective study. It's about, you know, 16,000 kids. So a lot of these studies have lots of children they're looking at. And um, they were looking for UTIs, bacteremia, pneumonia. They found that UTIs um, were documented in about 3.5% um, of kids. Okay, so that was the most there. And they found the sensitivity and specificity for this criteria, the traffic light criteria, um, for a serious bacterial illness, they found the sensitivity to be 85%, okay? But it was 85% if they included the red and the amber. Okay, so this is like the majority of kids, right? So basically, like, unless the kid was, like, skipping down the hall, they would be like, hmm, you need to be evaluated, right? And they only got a sensitivity of 85 there. So if they were to do the red only, the sensitivity drops down a little below 50%. That's not great, not great. Um, and if they only did uh, red, then, you know, specificity is about 75%. But again, you know, if you're less than 50%, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced. So if you did this criteria and you only looked at the red, you would have missed 20% of kids with UTIs and 8% of kids with pneumonia. Not good, not good. Um, and you would have also missed uh, about 15% of kids with bacteremia. So if you added a UA onto this, so if you did red criteria plus a UA, it would have brought your sensitivity up to 92%, okay, which is not, not bad. So again, not good alone, but if you add the UA to it, it makes it a little bit better. Okay, so now we're going to talk about um, some of the other approaches to fever. So, you know, when I trained, and back when many of you were practicing too, there were three choices that you had, right? You had your Boston criteria, you had your Rochester criteria, and you had your Philly criteria. And it was pretty simple, right? You chose one. I trained in Boston, so I had no choice. But basically, you know, I mean, for me, if you were less than three months, every kid got an LP, period. That was just the way it was, right? Well, things are changing now. Things are different now. And this is why it's really good that we're talking about this, because especially if you guys work with trainees, you know, if you start to bring up these criteria, they're going to look at you and be like, what are you talking about? Like, we don't do that anymore. So this is a really good review. Okay. So this all came out because they were trying to identify low-risk infants, right? And they were focused on kids 29 days to about eight weeks. Um, and in general, they define low-risk criteria by, you know, pristine physical exam, completely normal full septic workup, and a negative lumbar puncture. And... So the funny thing is, it's like, yeah, after you do that, what else is there left to do, right? You basically, like, poked every orifice. You've gotten every fluid. You evaluated everything. So, yeah, of course now the kids are, like, you know, low risk. Anyway, so they found that it had a sensitivity of 98%. And again, what did you miss, right? Like, what is that 2%? What else could you have done? Um, like, full body scan? I don't know. Um, Anyway, so again, the initial criteria mostly included lumbar punctures, right? And now what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out who can we exclude a lumbar puncture with. Okay, so um, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, they modified their original criteria um, to figure out which children could be discharged without a lumbar puncture, okay? So this is what we want to know here. So they said if you have a kid, right, it's basically like, you know, 29 days to, they said, 56 days old. Um, if you're full term, okay, greater than 37 weeks, no prolonged NICU stay, no chronic medical problems, um, no systemic antibiotics within 72 hours, if you're well-appearing, right, easily consolable, if you have no obvious infection on exam, and then they did get some blood work, so if your white count was between 5 and 15, and they give you a band to neutrophil account, and they did check a UA, um, so if the UA, if the white blood cell count on that, um, it was less than 10. If you fulfilled those criteria, and obviously no infiltrate if you get a chest x-ray, you're considered low risk and you don't need an LP. So that's, that's good, that's promising, moving in the right direction here. Okay, so now the question is, how good are the modified Philly criteria? So there's one article, um, one abstract that's not in your book here. Um, but it's from Pediatrics, December 2018. They found in one analysis that there was 0.2% of febrile children 29 to 60 days that had bacterial meningitis, okay? And um, the thing is, for the, these kids, that they did not fulfill the modified Philly criteria, 
uh, considered to be low risk, okay? So what this was really asking us is, do all these kids need LPs? And I think we're starting to see more and more data that says we don't. Okay, so this next one, this is the step-by-step -step protocol, and you have a picture in your book on that. And it's an algorithm, it uses a series of tests, you do the tests one at a time, Okay, and at each step of the test, if you pass it, you go on to the next, okay? If you pass all of them, then you're considered low risk. If you fail at any step, you're considered high risk, and then you get your full septic workup. Okay, and they found that this can be used for infants as young as 21 days of age, okay? So the general protocol here is you, you look at the kid, okay? They do a pediatric triangle, they talk about, which is basically appearance, work of breathing, circulation to skin, all right? The next step is you're going to check their age, okay? If they're less than 21 days, you're out. Um, you get a UA. If you've got pyuria, you're out, okay? You're going to get blood. If you've got a procalcitonin here, um, greater than 0.5, all right, you fall out. And then they look at either a CRP or an absolute neutrophil count. And again, if you pass all this, if all this is negative, you're considered low risk and you don't need to do it. So abstract two here um, compared the step-by-step -step approach to uh, Rochester criteria and the low the lab score, and um, and these are kids in fever without a source, for for four percent of which had an invasive bacterial illness, ten kids had meningitis, okay, and about twenty percent had a um, non-invasive bacterial infection. So they found that the sensitivity of the step-by-step -step approach was ninety-two percent. Rochester, 82%, and the lab score, only 60%. So the bottom line of this one was, um, you know, stick with the modified Philly because you end up doing better with that. All right, then there's this revised criteria. So this is one of the more re uh, recent risk stratification tools, and this is a project of the AAP. And um, so what they found here is these are the criteria. They looked at age 7 to 28 days, okay? So this is greater than one week. And again, white count 5 to 15, bands less than 1,500. So normal UAs, either a normal CRP or procalcitonin, and no antibiotics prior. So if you, okay, so if you fulfill these criteria, then um, they basically say that you don't have to get a lumbar puncture. And the take home here is they break it up into three different groups. So if you're less than seven days, no matter what, if you're less than seven days, you're getting an LP and you're getting admitted. Nobody's arguing with that, right? None of us are arguing with that. If you're between eight to 28 days, they're saying um, you either don't have to get an LP and you get admitted, or you get an LP plus antibiotics and get admitted. But if you're greater than 29 days, so 29 to 60, you don't get an LP and you can get discharged. So that's kind of the take home of what that was. All right, and then this next article, Abstract 3, talks about how good is our gut feeling. Um, and so what this says is this said that with a clinician's gut feeling, they, they, it had a sensitivity of about 60%, actually almost like the lab score, right? So that's good, we're as good as the lab score. Um, but our specificity was about 97%. The problem is that we missed almost 40% of the kids here with serious infections. So, you know, I, I, what, what this is saying is, what this is saying here is, are there phenomenal doctors? Absolutely, right? Are there doctors who will never miss anything? Maybe there are, okay? Maybe there are clinicians who will never miss anything. But we have these algorithms to kind of bring us towards the middle. Right? We have these algorithms to kind of help us and make sure we don't miss any of these other kids. And then the next section here says, do clinicians follow guidelines? Okay, so now we know we should be following these. Do we follow them? I will tell you this. Anytime you see a question that says, do clinicians follow guidelines, what do you think the answer is? No, we don't follow guidelines, right? It's never good. Um, so that's what this, one, this is what this one looked at. And what they found is that the rates of recommended treatment varied anywhere from 40% to 100%. Recommended management anywhere from about 65% okay, of neonates overall, um, which is not, you know, not ideal. Um, and then again, recommended management ranged anywhere from 40% to 88%. So again, kind of all over the place. So, you know, the take home here is that we don't do great, okay? And, and I think what this is also telling us, if you look at this, it says rates of recommended treatment. 
So rates of recommended treatment in the discharged infants, 3%, and in the admitted infants, 95%. Right? So basically, it's like we're deciding, we're like, this kid's going to go home, I'm not going to do anything for it. This kid's going to come in, I'm going to follow all the guidelines for it. Right? Whereas we really should be kind of using something to assess all of them uh, fairly. Okay, and then the next question here says, what are some of the general recommendations in the care of febrile children greater than 60 days of age? And this is, this is our last question of this, of this article here. And so this talks about the ASEP clinical policy um, for fever without a source for kids 20 to 24 months, okay? And it says that there's no clear evidence for management recommendations, okay? And it talks about, you, like the it answers four questions, and the first couple questions talk about UTIs, and we've already talked about that in our earlier sections. Um, but, you know, for some recommendations other than UTIs, it talks about chest x-ray for kids 2 to 24 months, when to get that. So if you have cough, hypoxia, RALS, fever greater than 39 um, for greater than 48 hours, then you can consider it. If you have um, tachypnea out of proportion to your fever, okay, or tachycardia out of proportion to your fever, then you can consider getting it. This is important also. They recommend not getting a chest x-ray if your kid's only presenting with, like, otherwise well-appearing, presenting with wheezing, and it looks like bronchiolitis, right? So we do not need chest x-rays and routine bronchiolitis if the kid's not looking sick. And then the last question for this part talked about lumbar punctures, and it basically talked about when do you do need a lumbar puncture, and basically what they left us with is, I can't help you with that. Right? That was their take home. They're like, you know, it's sorry guys, you guys are on your own. Um, so I think, you know, that just depends on you. It depends on how sick you think the kid looks, right? I think most of us are not LPing these kids. We're certainly not routine, routinely LPing them. And if they look ill, that's when we're taking it to the next step. And then abstract six, this is kind of just a where do we go from here? Right? This kind of just wraps up everything. And it just talks about um, that invasive bacterial illnesses. Um, why are we doing these evaluations? Well, it goes from 5% in the first month down to um, about 1% in the third month. Okay, this is why we're more aggressive on those kids early on. Um, regarding serious bacterial illnesses, um, it's 21% in the first week of life, but it declines to 8% after one month. So again, this is why we're seeing all these newer algorithms, um, you know, be a little bit more lax as you're getting a little bit older and more aggressive as you're younger, especially under that one week, right? Especially under 28 days, but really especially under one week. And then it kind of says for, farewell to some of our older approaches, right? To our good old Boston, Rochester, Philly criteria. And, um, you know, and hello to some of the newer algorithms. And then, again, we'll have to see where the procalcitonin and the CRP kind of fits into our practice. Okay. And with that, thank you guys so much. And I'm going to hand you off to our next speaker, um, Dr. Ducharme here. Thank you, guys.